Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the New York Film Festival. I'm Peter the Chairman of the Selection Committee for the Festival. Thank you very much. Uh, sometimes when the festival is uh, selected, people call me up and they want to do interviews. And one of the questions they ask very often is, what's your favorite film in the festival? And of course I say, come on, that's like asking me to choose among my children. <laughs> come on, I can't do that. They had asked me, what film in the festival are you most eager to see again? I would have said, you are not I. Uh, this is really like welcoming home an old friend. We're so delighted that this really terrific film will once again be part of the culture, part of our cinema, part of all our lives again. And I'm really proud that it's part of the New York Film Festival this year. So please welcome Sarah Driver. stepped up when um, the film was first found by the unit by Francis Poole and his partner Timothy um, Murray and uh, and Susan Lazarus has res with her as her last name Lazarus <laughs> has resurrected all my films <laughs> to restore everything to me. Um, I want to thank uh, the University of Delaware for finding and preserving the, the print that they found in Tangier among Paul Bowles' things and um, and and I, and I need very much to thank the New York Women in Film, Lois Bianche Award, Bianche Award, who restored the print and gave me the financing to restore it and were so supportive. And, um, and I couldn't have, what you're going to see tonight, I couldn't have done without them. And, um, thank you for coming up for us in the New York Film Festival for allowing it on this wonderful screen. I'm very excited you're all going to get to see it. It's very beautiful. <coughs> Thank you. Sarah, seeing it up on the big screen, I want to ask you, could you talk about the look that you were trying to achieve. The cinematography is really wonderful, and it's, I'm wondering what you, are, what you were thinking of in terms of the specific look that the film has. Well, I remember, I remember sitting at, um, in the, that was actually a fire school where we shot the blown up car scene. And I remember before we went to shoot, I just sat there and I just thought through all the shots. And, um, and I, I, wanted, I wanted the camera to move as the film went on, to be sort of more wide, and then to move more and more into the actual character of Ethel, so that by the end, we're forced inside her head in her reality. What was so wonderful is that we, the way Sarah had set up the shots, and uh, is that I could really work on like this kind of atomic scale, like each movement was so tiny but so important. It was just a, a very interesting sort of microscopic way of working, but wonderful. So seeing it again, it's amazing to see the fire scene and whatever. How are we able to do that? I mean, this is well, in the story, it's a train wreck, and I couldn't afford a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and there was a, a salvage place and they bought each car for fifty dollars and they brought them to my location and then the fire department was very happy to blow them up. <laughs> so they I brought them a keg of beer, they blew it up. And then actually that night the ambulance group called and they said they wanted to be in the movie too. So I wrote them a scene. And the firemen got really mad that I allowed their cousins and brothers and sisters in the movie too. 
<laughs> Francis, give us the background of how the film came to be here today. Uh, well, um, uh, I, I think I'll just uh, start by saying that um, I really, really love seeing this uh, projection uh, up close and seeing the detail. Um, and really appreciated it, um, seeing it on a large screen. I've seen most of most of my viewings have been on a, at a small screen. Um, I and, and meeting Suzanne was like um, meeting a ghost from. She's been haunting me since uh, 2009, and uh, that that was pretty incredible. Well, I was in Tangier in 2008. Um, I I first have to say that Tim Murray. Uh, Tim, stand up. Uh, he and I had been going back and forth. <laughs> Gross uh, He and I had been going back and forth to Tangier for some 10 years, uh, beginning in 1999, to try to acquire the, the papers and uh, uh, materials that uh, make up the Paul Bowles collection at the University of Delaware. In 2008, I happened to be in Tangier. I was giving a paper. Uh, Paul Bowles heir, Abdelwahed Boulech, uh, called me up and uh, asked me if I wanted to see some other materials that he had stored. And uh, I said, sure, yeah, be glad to. And he picked me up at the hotel where I was staying. We went to the uh, apartment. And um, it was a, a windowless uh, uh, ground floor apartment. I started crawling around in the dark, taking uh, photographs, digital pictures of everything that was scattered on the floor. There were letters from William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, um, Tennessee Williams, um, Gore Vidal, uh, just about anyone you could imagine, because Bowles, his life really touched so many of the great uh, literary and artistic figures of the 20th century, were scattered all over the floor. So over in this one corner, there's a bookshelf, and I happen to see uh, Paul and Jane's, uh, Jane Bowles typewriters, and below them was this case. And I didn't know what it might be. It looked a bit like a film case, and I went and picked it up and looked at it. I couldn't make out the address, but I took a couple of shots of it. Got back to um, <laughs> Delaware, and immediately went to Tim, and um, said, take a look at these pictures. You think we ought to go back? Because the stuff is there, and Abdul Wahid obviously wants to you know, to dispose of it, and they offered it to us. And uh, so we went back in, in February of 2009. I'll just read, if I may. Sorry, I don't want to bore you, but <clears throat> in early 2009, Tim Murray and I traveled to Tangier to sort and pack up the bowls <coughs> materials for shipment. It took Tim and I approximately two weeks to get all the bowls materials ready to send back to the, to the United States. We worked nine and 10 hour days in an apartment with no windows and no ventilation. Often when we left in the evening, our clothes would be soaking wet with perspiration and covered with a white powdered insecticide, which apparently preserved the film because the film was covered with insecticide, which Abdullah had said was for the bugs. Um, and it must have worked. After a while, Tim began referring to his jeans as poison pants. <laughs> afraid, afraid that the film might be lost in transit, we managed to fit the case in my carry-on bag for a flight from Casablanca to Madrid and then on to the United States. And when we got back uh, to the States, uh, Megan Mavlichuk, who's here tonight, uh, who uh, works in the film and video collection department, and I uh, put it on the cine scan, and amazingly, the print uh, looked in, in pretty good condition. So it was then, you know, the, the chore was to find out um, if we could get in contact with Sarah Driver, and the rest is what you see here so for tonight. For a film, for black and white, which is a very delicate material, to have lasted 30 years in a terrible, humid environment, and I do think it's about that, um, it, it's really quite a, mir a miracle. And we also think it was because 
it was in a cardboard box. It wasn't in a pristine, you know, pristine like film can or anything that was airtight. There was air going through, which is why we think the film was actually safe. Yeah, there were no, there were no film cans. The, the, the films were in reels inside this weird looking case. And, you know, I have to say, I feel like uh, this would not have happened had it not been for Paul Bowles. <coughs> there is a presence here tonight uh, that I, I feel uh, resonates with the Bowlesian kind of, of uh, weird pulling together passively of, uh, you know, disparate elements, personalities, and events to make something happen. He was, he was very, very good at that. So I feel like Paul really made this happen. And uh, I have to say also thanks to Abdelwahed Boulish, uh, his uh, heir, who somehow picked up this uh, film case and carried it with him and placed it in this empty apartment building for 10 years uh, without anyone knowing about it. So, and uh, you have, I must say, Suzanne, you have the presence of the Sphinx in this film. I swear, it's, it's just incredible. Um, and uh, delight to meet you and see the film again. Will you? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get some questions from all of you. <coughs> yes. What was it like, um, I guess, realizing that you, there was a, you know, a copy of your film out there? I mean, what was, what was your reaction when you first heard that this was uh, that, that, that a, a new reel, or that an old reel, I guess, had been located? Um, what was your reaction when you discovered that there was a print of the film? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was like a, it was, it was, I, I really, I thought the film was gone and lost. And then when Francis called, and he was very nervous on the phone, mm -hmm. and I was, I was in shock. And I couldn't believe it. I had forgotten that I had said this print to Paul Bowles in 1982 because there was no VHS then. There was no, you know, there was nothing else. I had wanted him to see the film and I had wanted to thank him. And the New York Times piece had said, oh, I was afraid of being sued. Well, I didn't own anything in 1982. <laughs> the idea of the lawsuit was, I, wasn't even in my mind. I sent it to him because I wanted to thank him and I wanted to know what he thought of the film and if I had interpreted the story the way that, that he, he approved of. And so it was just so wonderful when Francis called and said that he had found it and it was in good condition. I mean, it was really quite miraculous. Yes? Well, did you then, did you ever hear back from him? Did from you ever hear back from yeah. him? Yeah, we had a correspondence for a number of years. And, um, um, and he wrote back to me, and, and he really he liked the film. His letters were always a little bit dry. He, he, what was also wonderful about Francis finding is I revisited the letters that he wrote to a 24-year-old filmmaker, and who he, you know, was so kind and so generous. I mean, I found that we found the letters, and um, and I, I I was like crying because here was somebody who was so trusting and wonderful. And I remember he wrote me and he said. I can't give you the rights, you have to go to my um, agents at William Morris. I said, uh oh. And I went to his agents at William Morris, and they said, we'll give you all the rights. They saw the film, they gave me all the rights. And I said, and they said, we would not have given you the rights if you had made, if you had come just with the screenplay. We gave you the rights because we, we like this movie. Mm -hmm. And um, and Paul was very, you know, he, there was the oldest, the older actress, he thought it was a little bit overacting a tiny bit. But, <laughs> He said that he I, he was very positive about it. He seemed to like it. And what part of when Francis found the film, we made an HD cam off the found print, which is now in the special collections. And I had the privilege of going to two conferences last year to celebrate Paul Bowles' hundredth birthday, and to be with the academics and to be with the people who knew Paul Bowles. It was very moving, and I also, what an expansive life he had. I, I had no idea about that he was a, compo a really well-known composer before he became a writer. He was also a music critic. Um, so, you know, I, I, that was an amazing privilege to also be with people who knew him and, and also really accepted the film and really thought it was a good representation and an adaptation. 
Questions how uh, Sarah directed to them. Watching it now, I haven't seen it in many years. I mean, it, it's amazing to me how everything seems like it's all timed and, you know, like very precisely coordinated to go have this go with this. But it really didn't feel like that, which is fun. I mean, it, it felt like you and I would kind of get into this zone of you know, I felt like basically I was I was in, a, in one of those snow things, you know, and Sarah kind of kept me in there, and that was good for what, for being Ethel. And I told Melody Schneider, the sister, I said, bring a few things that you feel really territorial about to the set. And, and that also helped, I think, also yeah. with her, you know, fighting for her space. But I remember, that's right, you were very isolated and kept very isolated during, we, we shot it six days. Right, and we were like living and shooting like in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> All of us, were crew and everybody. But yeah, it, and, and then the voiceover too, it, it was, it, it wasn't, you, I mean, I, you never made it, so I felt like I had to, you know, follow, like I was on a, on a, a click track. It's like it. It all came very easily. You know, we didn't have um, we didn't have any playback or anything. No. And, and <laughs> that's right. And Suzanne couldn't see anything because if I ran the steam back for her to see anything, you'd hear that. Yeah. So she had to do the voiceover without seeing any image. Yeah. So it was just about like really structuring it very. You know, of thinking about the voiceover, what was going to be said there while shooting, and then later. I actually recorded your voice. I mean, it, everything was very handmade, you know. It, totally so, handmade. You know, yeah. like I was transferring my own mag stock, you know, a little quarter inch onto the regular stock, and um, but that's right. We didn't. I, you didn't do. No, you didn't do the voice under any image. Yeah, right. that's right. You know, I remember I I had to edit in different places. I didn't have any money. It was like a. I, it was about a year and a half of of stopping and starting and. And I remember I was editing in the film center building that was on 42nd Street and 9th Avenue. And I was editing in a back room, and all of a sudden somebody came out and went, fire! And I was like, fire? <laughs> and then somebody said, fire to this porno studio that was like right next door to where I was working. <laughs> but I was always, I, it seems like I edited in different places in the city. And I remember one time I was editing downtown on a steam deck, and, um, and this friend of ours, came in and he looked at this steam bag and he said, Sarah, I can get you one of those for 10 bucks. Uh, <laughs> no, a truckload of them that are like down the street that somebody's actually gonna take. Do you want any of those? I was like, no, I don't think I want any. <laughs> but um, because, I, because I had to stop and start, I think it made me even think about the film more, you know, because I, I, I had to stop every time I didn't, ran out of money and then I had to start again. And the sound was really important to me. And the majority of the budget was actually spent on the sound mix. So I concentrated a lot on the sound and I saved all the money for the mix at the end. Um, so that I could have a really good sound mix. Because I, 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 at that time I was seeing a lot of low budget films and the sound was bad. And I was like, yeah, but the sound is 50% of the film. So you have to do equal with the image as the sound. So I, and I did all my own tracks and all my own effects and, you know, I mean, I was splitting all the tracks and all that, and it was a great learning experience. Please join us now for a reception honoring Sarah in the film in the Furman Gallery.